Peter will be preaching from the prophet Habakkuk, and that is where our reading will come from this evening. If you have a church Bible, it's page 664, and we're going to read the whole chapter. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigionoth, which is a musical term. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Timan, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, raised rays flashed from his hand, where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled. The old aged hills collapsed. Sorry, the age old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bows. You called for many arrows, sailor. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by, the deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded, My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. So far the reading of God's word. Thank you, Brendan. Let's see. Maybe we should go around like that. There we go. There we go. No escaping now. (laughs) Tonight we're in Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3. First you have to pronounce his name, then you have to find him in the Bible. And once you have him, you don't let him go. 
because there's a blessing to be had. And I've entitled chapter 3, The Triumph of Faith. The Triumph of Faith. You see, the prophet Habakkuk was a prophet of complaints in chapter 1. And in chapter 3, he has become the prophet of praise. He's gone from complaint to praise in three short chapters. But of course, it didn't happen that quickly. We know from reading this that for Habakkuk, there was much anxiety of heart and anguish of soul as he sought the Lord with his complaints and as he listened to what God had to say and as he reflected deeply on God's answer. So the Lord moved his heart from complaint to praise. Perhaps that's been your experience from time to time in your Christian life. As you have brought your complaints before the Lord, and as you have waited upon Him, He has turned your heart from complaint to praise. The triumph of faith. Well, if you have your Bibles open there, notice that uh, the very last verse of chapter 2 urges the whole world to be silent before the presence of the sovereign Creator God. Chapter 1, verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And as we wait in the silence at the end of chapter 2, suddenly the silence is broken as Habakkuk's prayer of praise bursts forth in chapter 3, that the whole earth might know that God in his holy, is in his holy temple and that God is to be praised. Now you notice as Brendan read this chapter that the Hebrew word Selah appears twice. This is the only time outside of the book of Psalms that we come across Selah. And Selah is used in the book of Psalms to denote praise and worship and singing. It's a musical term and it's uh, uh, and so here it appears in Habakkuk chapter 3 to show that uh, this psalm is a, a psalm or a poem that was sung in Israel's temple worship. The Lord is in his holy temple. So let's lift up our praises to him. And, and, and so you see in this beautiful chapter, Habakkuk is leading the people in singing a prayer of praise. He has heard the word of the Lord in chapter 2 pronouncing woes on the nation's enemies. And even though God's judgment is also about to fall on Judah, he leads the people in praise. The Babylonians are coming, and yet here he is singing praises to God. How do you explain that? <laughs> How do you explain that? He knows the Babylonians are coming against Judah because God has so willed it, and yet here he is <coughs> praising Worshipping. Well, it's because he knows the Babylonians will not have the final word regarding the fate of God's people. God will have that final word. Faith has triumphed over complaint. The triumph of faith. Verse 2 of chapter 3. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day, in our time make them known, and wrath, remember mercy. And for the better part of chapter 3, Habakkuk will be recalling the history of God's mighty acts. And he is in awe of God's purposes. And now he wants God here in chapter 2, uh, in verse 2, to do again what he's done in the past. Now for God to do that, Habakkuk understands that this will mean the Babylonians will come. But as God's wrath comes down upon their heads, he asks that God will show mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk has moved away from the position of complaining to God that it was not right that the people of God should suffer. And as long as he persisted in that attitude, 
of complaining, he would remain in perplexity, he would remain unhappy in heart and mind. But now he has been lifted up to the Lord's holy temple. He has seen the whole earth beneath God's feet. And he has seen that indeed all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So he trusts now in the mercy and salvation of God. Even though it will mean that the land of Judah will be rendered desolate, as we're told there in verse 17 in very graphic and poetic terms. The land will be left desolate. You see, up until now, there's been 150 years of Assyrian oppression. And now the Assyrian oppressor, uh, uh, oppressor is to be replaced by the Babylonian oppressor, and the oppression of the land of Israel will continue. That means that the earlier Old Testament promises of peace and health and long life and prosperity for the people of God have all collapsed and have long since disappeared for Israel and Judah. That is no longer a possibility. That's no longer even on the horizon. As Habakkuk lifts his prayer to God, he doesn't go back to those ancient promises. Rather, for Habakkuk, it is enough to know that God has not forgotten his people, that the Lord will triumph in the end, that he will remember mercy in the midst of wrath. You see, it's God's future triumph rather than his immediate blessing is Habakkuk's reason for rejoicing. He's not rejoicing that the Babylonians are coming. He's rejoicing that as he sees beyond the current suffering, he sees beyond that to God's eventual triumph. That's his reason for rejoicing. Another way to think about that in more modern terms is that a prosperity gospel that looks to God for immediate blessings and the avoidance of life's hardship would have meant nothing to the people of God during these long years of foreign opposition as the nation slowly ran down to oblivion. Habakkuk was not interested in the prosperity gospel. They had been suffering now for hundreds of years, 150 years with more to come. God has promised there would be no relief. Yet he has also promised that in the midst of wrath he would remember mercy. There would be no turning back for Habakkuk and the people to the promised blessings of the past. Those past blessings would instead eventually give way to a messianic blessing of salvation and eternal life. A new heavens and a new earth, and only then will there be the fulfillment of immediate blessing for the remnant of God's people. So with all that in mind, Habakkuk now begins recounting God's mighty acts from the past. That's verses 3 to 15. And what we have in these verses is a collage. You know what a collage is? That's what the, that's what the kids do at school. They get a collage and all kinds of different uh, things are put together to create an impression. This is a collage, a collection of many images to convey an impression of past experience and future expectation of God's dealings with his people. For this collage, Habakkuk has drawn from the songs of Moses the songs of Deborah, and the songs of David to show the coming of the Lord and all his glory. The Lord has indeed come, and the Lord will come again. And all who wait patiently for him are living by faith in the promises of God and are full of joy and praise. So we have in this collage a recalling of God's help and care in the Exodus deliverance, the crossing of the Red Sea, the wilderness wanderings, the crossing of the Jordan, the conquest of Canaan, and the time of the judges. 
This is how the just or the righteous will live by faith in the midst of calamity, by recounting past blessings and trusting in God's word of future hope, waiting patiently for God to act as they endure present groaning. You notice in verse 16, this is Habakkuk's groaning. In joy he is groaning. He is groaning in his joy. He groans patiently as he rejoices with joy. See, we shouldn't think that groaning and joy cannot exist side by side in the heart of faith. Look how he describes it in verse 16. My heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. You ever felt like that? When life is not going the way that you would like it to go and there's a health crisis or a financial crisis or a relationship crisis. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the land be laid bare, verse 17, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food and there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. You see, that's a picture of what it's going to mean that the Babylonians are coming. They're going to sweep through the land and they will leave nothing behind. There will be no trees. There will be no crops. There will be no livestock. There will be no food. The nation will be devastated. The land will be left desolate. The people will either be killed or taken into captivity. Though the land be laid bare, yet the Lord, says Habakkuk, is still my saviour. Verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my saviour. That's staggering, isn't it? That's a staggering testimony to the triumph of faith. That as he sees that imminent desolation, he can turn around and say that in his heart he is full of joy and rejoicing. Joy in the midst of calamity. <clears throat> because verse 19 will still be true even when the Babylonians come. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of deer and enables me to go on the heights. And where are those heights? Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And now right at the end, the Lord enables me to go onto those heights, to those high places where I can wait upon him and listen to what he has to say. And I still my heart before him and open my heart to his word, to his word of promise, to his word of future expectation. And so Habakkuk says, in the midst of calamity, the Lord is my strength. And so redemptive history holds its breath, waiting for the final act of the drama of the ages of which the Babylonian invasion was a minor act. And that final act was nothing less than the coming to earth from heaven of God's only Son, whom he gave up into the hands of murderous and sinful men in order to be a sacrifice for our sins. The calamity of Judah in the days of Habakkuk fell on Jesus. Jesus, you see, was left desolate. In the midst of the wrath of the cross, God remembered mercy. And in the resurrection of his son, God won the victory over all the enemies of his people. A victory that awaits a final revelation. Like Habakkuk, like Habakkuk, we live in a day of calamity. All around us there is wickedness, all around us there is temptation, all around us there is everything that would pull us away from a faith and a love in Jesus Christ. Yet we have seen the great acts of God played out in our redemptive past. We have a testimony of how God is, has acted in our lives personally and powerfully many times in the past to encourage us and to bless us 
and to make us strong. And in this day of calamity, we remember how he has held us and we remember his promises for the future. And so we stand. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Like Habakkuk, we trust in God's word concerning a day of triumph that is coming. Like Habakkuk, we face the struggles of the present while putting our hope in a future promise. I have a little illustration for you here to illustrate this. Perhaps um, you're like Margaret and I, we watch the six o'clock news every night, viewing by appointment, they call it, for baby boomers. And, uh, and of course, we're very keen to see the weather map because there's laundry to be done the next day and do we need to water the garden tonight? Is there going to be rain tomorrow? And you see these anxieties that come to us in the days of calamity. And so we watch the weather map. And I don't know how many weather maps we've watched over the years. Must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And inevitably, you see these cold fronts moving across the country. They come from the west and they move across New Zealand and they disappear to the east into the Pacific Ocean to some poor bloke that's out there on a boat. You see, and, and it's these prevailing westerly winds that push these fronts onto the country and the same winds that push them onto the country are the same winds that will push them off the country. Sometimes they move very quickly, depends how strong the wind is. Sometimes they hang around and they linger and it's a day of calamity. Strong winds that blow over trees and heavy rains that cause floods. So as we're standing there watching the wind and feeling that rain and wondering if uh, the plants are going to survive the deluge, and, and as we stand there, what do we say to ourselves? Do we collapse in terror and hopelessness and despair? No, we don't. Because we have seen those weather maps now, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them for a long, long time. And in every one of them, those fronts pass over eventually and disappear. And the sun comes out. So we remind ourselves of what's happened in the past. And we remind ourselves that this front that is over us right now will indeed pass. It will pass. Yes, the Babylonians are coming. <clears throat> but it will pass and God will have the final word with a maturing faith we trust humbly yet persistently in God's purposes for establishing righteousness on the earth then verse 16 Habakkuk says I wait patiently Habakkuk waits in patient dread for the judgment he knows will fall on Judah and eventually on the Babylonians. A judgment that will indeed desolate land and nation. It will be the end indeed of the Old Testament promises of material prosperity and well-being. And Habakkuk himself knows that he too will be caught up in this coming destruction. Though deliverance is certain, it will only come after judgment. And so he cries out, O Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. At a later date in redemptive history, when the remnant of faithful Israel was reduced to a single person, alone in the garden, <coughs> looking into the awesome abyss of hell, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's anointed, sweated great drops of blood. Even though he was assured that God his Father would not leave his soul in hell, yet the reality of the agonies he had to endure before that deliverance came overwhelmed him. Like Habakkuk, his soul was exceedingly troubled. Like Habakkuk, in verse 16, Christ's body bore the physical symptoms of the coming calamity. Here was a judgment he had to bear. Just as Judah had to go through the Babylonian judgment. You see, it was a picture 
It was a redemptive <coughs> historical anticipation that the Lord Jesus Christ, who stands in place of his people, had to bear the coming judgment that was coming upon him. And as it loomed large before him in the garden, he saw that he was to become the enemy of God, just like Judah, as he bore our sins. And so, like all of God's enemies, he had a judgment to bear. He had a cup to drink. Just look again in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 16. As Habakkuk talks about the judgment that's coming on Babylon, you see at the end of verse 16 of chapter 2, the cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, Babylon, and disgrace will cover your glory. The cup of God's wrath. And now as Jesus contemplated what was coming toward him in the garden, the cup of God's wrath came around to him in God's right hand. And in that cup was a disgrace that would cover his glory as he bore the sin of his people and drank that cup of judgment to its dregs. So there is now only the cup of salvation for us to drink. We rejoice in our salvation, surrounded by the calamity of the cross where God has remembered mercy. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. So a book that began with complaint and distress ends in joy. Faith in God's promises will carry us through calamities. Songs sung in the midst of such darkness anticipates the glad arrival of an eternal dawn in which the faithful will receive the reward of a full salvation secured for them by Jesus Christ and sealed to them by his indwelling spirit. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You see, like Habakkuk, for us, God is all we need when God is all we have. The triumph of faith. Amen. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father God, you know each of our individual situations and you know what each of us have been called upon to bear. And as we see this lovely story of Habakkuk and what he was called upon to bear, we thank you that you have preserved for us the triumph of his faith, a triumph that can direct our faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and no joy in the midst of calamity. But Father, we pray you would give us that maturing faith that trusts you for the future based on your promises and based on your great redemptive acts in the past, that we might find joy in the midst of trouble. We might find rejoicing in the midst of a fallen world, that we might find reason for strength and encouragement in times of personal crisis and hardship. We thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore the wrath and who brings to us the mercy of our salvation. We ask, Father, that by his indwelling spirit, he would encourage us tonight and tomorrow, Monday and on Tuesday and strengthen us in our Christian walk, witness and commitment as we await that great day of that eternal dawn. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.